Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. It's Matthew 24, 9. The, 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 the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers and elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so was Capias, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Good morning, everyone. How you doing? Uh, we are uh, preaching through the, the book of Acts, and we've uh, come to a really a turning point in, uh, in the church. Uh, if you remember the first uh, chapter, second chapter of Acts, it talked about they, uh, they were doing, the church was doing these things and they had the favor of all the people. And so the church was favored in Jerusalem. And then we have this event in which we have the persecution begin. And so uh, in the previous chapter, chapter seven, we talked about how a lame man was in front of the temple and begging as he usually did. And Peter and John came up and and healed him of that lameness, and he got up and he walked and he began to praise God. And from that event, that miracle, the Peter and John, Peter especially, preached the gospel. They wanted to attach that miracle to the works of Jesus. And again, as, as I've said before, what we see throughout this uh, book of Acts is this pattern of deed or situation and then a word, a message that comes afterwards to explain what exactly is going on with that deed or that situation. And so we had the deed, the, the healing of the lame man, and then we had the, Peter preach the sermon to explain that the power of that healing comes from Jesus. And now we have, because of that message, a persecution begins, fulfilling one of the great prophecies of Jesus has for the apostles and, unfortunately, uh, for us as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we jump into uh, chapter 4. Father, once again, we come before you, God, and we uh, ask you to, <laughs> to enlighten us and, <laughs> excuse me, and um, inform us, God, but, but more than that, we, we need to be transformed. We, God, we, we recognize we have no power in and of ourselves to, to um, make ourselves do anything that is of eternal value in our own flesh. We need to rely upon you and the power that you've given us by your Holy Spirit. And so today, God, it's no different. We want to hear from you, and we want to avail ourselves of, of that Spirit's ministry in our lives as he transforms, changes us, convinces us, of truth and and um, and uh, counsels us against error, and so God, open our eyes to these things that we may, we might glorify you with our hearts and minds and our ears as we listen to your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name, Amen. And so uh, <coughs> Frank started out with that verse from Matthew twenty four nine. Let me um, just read that again. Uh, this is Jesus speaking about what will happen to the apostles because it was going to happen to him. It says. Then, after the resurrection, you will be handed over and be persecuted and put to death. And you'll be hated by all nations because of me. Not the greatest rallying cry, right? You would, you would think, that's not very motivational, Jesus. It's like, you know, halftime, the, the um, you know, coach says, well, you guys tried really hard out there, but you're just not good enough. You're probably going to do worse in the, the second half. So it, that wouldn't be very motivational. But Jesus isn't seeking to necessarily motivate us, right? The primary uh, ministry of Jesus was to reveal what would be true. And today in our world, we have two kingdoms clashing. And whenever kingdoms clash, there is conflict. And in our case, there is persecution and ultimately death for those of us who, who seek to follow Jesus. But what does that mean for us today? What does it mean for them? So the first point I want to make is simply this. Proclaiming the truth will bring persecution. If you pro proclaim what is true, it will bring persecution. Uh, let me just read those first few verses, verse 1 and 2 again. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John 
while they were speaking to the people. So right in the middle of the sermon, they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. So they focused in on one point. They were proclaiming the resurrection of the dead. Like modern Christianity, ancient Judaism, modern Judaism has a, a number of different sects, different denominations, if you will, uh, with different beliefs, different nuances. And it's the same thing in the ancient world. Um, you had ancient Judaism had a number of different sects, that some of which are mentioned in the scriptures, some of which aren't mentioned in the scriptures, but we do know about. So here we have a number of these sects coming to, um, into, uh, that, that being highlighted here. First we have the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees. The priests were simply descendants of Moses' brother Aaron. Uh, you could not be a priest in the, in the temple rituals unless you were a descendant of Aaron, and they were responsibility or had responsibilities for all the temple activities. So all the sacrifices, all the rituals, the priests did all that because they were descended from Levi and from Aaron, uh, and they were given that responsibility. In fact, um, we know that, that certain groups of priests, certain tribes of priests, had certain responsibilities at different times of the year. So that's kind of how we know how John the Baptist, uh, when he was born, because his father was a priest of a such, such a tribe, and we knew when he was. So there's a lot of ways we can figure these things out. But they were very prominent. The temple needed to have priests because you need to have a, uh, an, an intermediary between God and you, right? I just, in the ancient world, I couldn't just walk up to the Holy Holies and rip open the curtain and walk in. It would have been problematic because I would have died. Right? And so you need to have an intermediary, and priests are the intermediary between God and human beings. Now, we don't need priests because there is one priest, it's Jesus, and we can go directly to God. So that's changed. But by this time, the priests were more than just doing uh, rituals in the temple. They also were a very powerful political bloc. They had a lot of political power. The temple guards, they were relatives of the chief priests. They were soldiers. And so not only did you have Roman soldiers in ancient Jerusalem, for example, but you also had temple guards. They were an army that were defending the, the priests and the temple responsibilities there. They kept order, basically, on the temple mount. There was a riot. The Romans would be there, but also the temple uh, guard would be there uh, as well. Mainly they let the temple guard take care of that because, again, Gentiles, Romans, on the temple mount would have been problematic, would have caused even greater riot. So these, they were needed... But they were mainly political, even though they were religious. So, sound familiar? That things don't change very much in our day and age. The Pharisees, which will be mentioned later on, are the ones who we are most familiar with. We all hear about the Pharisees. Uh, they were legalistic. They were the kind of very legalistic sect of, of the ancient Judaism. Um, they were so legalistic, they added uh, additional laws to the law of Moses to protect you from breaking, their, their mindset was this, if the law says don't do this and you, and you break that, you're in trouble, therefore, let's not even get to that area, let's, let's have another few laws in front of it that you have to break before you get to the real law, and so they try to protect you, and they'd make all these, these laws up that were made of man to protect you from breaking God's law, so they were trying to do the good, but they became very legalistic, they were, they, they were the ones who ran the synagogues uh, in different parts of Israel, they were generally middle class people, though a, a few did have money, but they hated Rome, and they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They believed in life after death. And after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the Pharisees were really the ones that continued Judaism because of the, the synagogue structure they had, and they preserved the scriptures. We should all give it to the Pharisees, because without the Pharisees, we wouldn't actually have the Old Testament scriptures preserved like they are today. So even though they're kind of like the bad guys sometimes in the scriptures, they're not the bad guys. They were just a different sect. In fact, the scriptures later on in Acts, we'll get to it, that many priests and Pharisees came to believe in Jesus, right? Even beyond uh, 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 Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, so more came. Um, the Sadducees were another member, another part, another Jewish sect. And like the Pharisees, uh, excuse me, unlike the Pharisees, uh, they were not someone who liked Rome. They didn't add extra laws to the, the, the God's law. They just said the law is the law. Just follow that. You don't need to add anything to it. It's just God's law is enough. Uh, they actually tolerated the Romans. They didn't mind the Romans too much because the Romans gave them a lot of business opportunities. 
But they did not believe in the resurrection. They believed in this life, and when you're dead, you're dead, and that was it. So Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Uh, the Sadducees generally came from wealthy, upper-class families. That's why they liked those business opportunities. And uh, most of the chief priests were Sadducees rather than, than Pharisees. Uh, and the, Sad and the uh, Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, again, was made mostly up of Sadducees. In general, the Sadducees liked wealth. They liked power. They liked prestige. And they would work with the Romans or anyone uh, to help uh, uh, move them up in the, the ladder of success. Uh, they did have good parts, right? They, so the law was the law. God's word was God's word. And uh, they wouldn't kind of discipline their followers outside of God's word, whereas the Pharisees would do a lot more disciplining as legalistic sects tend to be. Um, the Pharisees were more in tune with the everyday person. The Sadducees, obviously because they were upper class, did not um, have a lot to do with the, the lower classes. Uh, Jesus didn't interact with the Sadducees very much because the Sadducees pretty much remained in Jerusalem. They were linked to the priest and the temple um, activities there. Uh, the week before his crucifixion, I remember Jesus had a debate with them uh, at the temple, proving from the word of God that there was a resurrection from the dead, that people didn't just die and that was it. This is uh, what he said. This is Mark 12, 25. He says, Now about the dead rising, have you not read in the book of Moses in the account of the burning bush, how God said to him, that's Moses, I am, present tense, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly mistaken. Right? So very harsh words. He is the God of the living, not of the dead. You guys, you, you're religious leaders, but you are badly mistaken. Uh, a little different than just, you know, off a little bit like the Pharisees were. And so, uh, Peter's teaching uh, that Jesus rose from the grave catches the Sadducees' attention. They, they, they're listening. They're probably agreeing with much of what Peter is saying. And then they get to the part with the resurrection from the dead. Oh, we don't believe that. That's not in our doctrinal statement. We can't have that. And so um, when the priests and the temple god see Peter and John preaching to the crowd and they mention that, they arrest them. But note what the scripture says. They did not arrest them because they were teaching. They did not arrest them because they were followers of Jesus. Remember, that was considered kind of a, another sect of Judaism. People who followed Jesus were Jews. They arrest them because they're teaching that Jesus rose from the dead. So it's the one point that they get arrested for. They, they didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were, you probably heard this before, that's why they were sad, you see, because they did not believe in the resurrection. You haven't heard that before? That's an oldie but goodie. Sad you see, they were sad you see, because they didn't wait. <laughs> anyway, here's the point. You'll notice even today that people will agree with you on a lot of things as a Christian, right? People will agree with you that Jesus was a good teacher. He gave some great teachings. They'll agree with you that God exists. They maybe even will agree with you that that people are sinners in need of a savior. They, they may agree with you that there's a place called heaven or a place called hell. But as soon as you mention one thing that goes against their ideology, against their worldview, they will react. You will get pushback. So when you teach that Jesus is the only way to God, the one and only way, when all the other religions are actually diff different ways to a place called hell, you'll get pushback. When you explain that all sin is sin and not all love is real love as the Bible def defines it, you will be hated. Truth will separate. If you preach the truth, you will be hated, Jesus says. The Sadducees were probably good with a lot of the teachings of Jesus and his apostles, but as soon as the teaching crossed some arbitrary line of their ideology, persecution begins. And that's the challenge. Everybody has some arbitrary line someplace. People will tolerate a lot, but you sometimes I'll cross a line with someone. I've said some pretty, you know, I'm sharing my faith, and I'll say some pretty, you know, truthful things, pretty hard things people to accept. And they're like, okay, yeah. And then they say something I think is just like innocuous, and they're like, wait a minute, how offensive. I'm like, what? What? what did I, I don't even know what I said, right? Uh, so 
be aware, it's not about, um, you know, the, uh, kind of a line we, or uh, uh, boundaries we, we keep ourselves in. Just certain truths will affect certain people because they're maybe dealing with that stuff in their own, own lives, right? And so, and when you speak the truth, and if the Holy Spirit begins to convict someone, there's only two options. They will give into the Holy Spirit and go, oh, I understand. Or they will rebel against the Holy Spirit, right, and take it out on you and me because you've spoken the truth. So you need to understand that truth will always bring persecution. When you proclaim the truth, it will bring persecution. And the more you proclaim it, the more you will be persecuted. It's not in your outline, but Peter says that if anyone wants to walk like Jesus walks, live like Jesus lives, then he says, you will be persecuted. Not might be persecuted, right? but will be persecuted. And it begs the question today, how many of us are persecuted? If we're not persecuted, maybe the reason is we're not sharing the truth. Probably the reason. I know when my life is going easy and everybody likes me and gives me a pat on the back, it's probably because I'm not saying difficult things to people that I think they need to hear. Um, and, and when I'm getting along with people that maybe I disagree with, it's probably because we're not disagreeing on certain things, you know, verbal with each other. And so, proclaiming the truth will bring persecution. The second thing I want you to notice in the passage here <coughs> is what made them preach this gospel with boldness because they understood. The message was greater than the men. The, the message that, that Peter and John had was much, much greater than who they thought they were. Verse 3, they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. We don't want these guys wandering around. We'll just keep them in jail until they can be tried the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men, and that's just men, by the way, not men and women, who believed grew to about 5,000. So Jesus had, had told them of this day many times. Matthew 24, we read. Here's another one from Luke 24. Jesus said this, They will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and put you in prison. And you will be brought before kings and governors, all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. Again, notice the words there. Not my, You will. Bear testimony to me by the way that you are persecuted. I know none of us want to do that. I would rather bring testimony to Jesus' name by being kind and genteel with people. Wouldn't you? But sometimes that's not what God calls us to. Sometimes he calls us to tell people the truth precisely because we love them. I, mean, I use this illustration a lot when I'm sharing. If I'm sitting on the side of a road in my lawn chair, you know, drinking a Mai Tai or, you know, whatever, or my mimosa with a little umbrella, just kind of watching the cars go by, and I notice there's a sign that says, Bridge out, it's fallen over, and nobody sees it, and I'm going, waving at people as they go by, right? Hey, how you doing? Have a good day. Am I a good person or am I a bad person? I'm a bad person, right? If I just let them go by, am, am, I, am I being a loving person or am I being an unloving person? If I'm being an unloving person, I'm letting them go to their death because they don't see the sign. And I'm not, I'm not lifting the sign. I'm just sitting there enjoying life. And many Christians do that. We enjoy life so much that we don't bother picking up the sign that says bridge out. And we're not loving and we're not kind and we're not doing what we're called to do. The problem is when we pick up that sign... And people read, go, bridge out, they go, I was there yesterday, that bridge is not out, you're a liar. And they'll keep going, because they won't believe you. That's okay. It doesn't mean you haven't done the right thing. It doesn't mean you're not a loving person by doing and proclaiming the truth. And Peter and John understood that. Tradition says that all the apostles, except for John, though they tried to kill him, uh, died for their faith. Every single one thought the message was so important that they were willing to give up their lives for it. But here, persecution just starts slowly. It just starts slowly. Oh, you, I don't like that little point you're preaching with the resurrection. Into jail you go because I don't want you to be a troublemaker until the next morning we can deal with you and ask you the question. Just, just let's remove you for a second, right? No death, just, just get you out of the picture here. See, God will often allow us to increase in our trials slowly. 
to prove our faithfulness to him. Not that he needs to know how faithful we are. He already knows how faithful we are. But we need to know. You and I need to know how faithful we are so we can assess ourselves and so we can take the next step. So if what I just said two seconds ago, you went, oh yeah, that's me. I'm, with, I'm the guy with the, the mimosa. Then you know where you stand in your faithfulness. Take the next step. And so God will sometimes put trials in our lives to, to um, give us the, 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 the impotence to, 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 to move forward in our lives. And so what happens here is that Sanhedrin will eventually release Peter and John, and, and the two will go back, we'll read this later on next week, to the believers, and they will all pray. But I want to mention, I'll mention it when we get to the passage too. Notice they don't pray for protection, right? Much different than what I would do. If I was arrested, right, because I was preaching, the first thing I would go, Lord, next time I preach, please protect me from arrest. Please let me be not arrested so I can preach boldly for you, right? I'll, just get the arrest part out of the picture. I'll do everything else. But when they went back and they prayed, what they prayed for was continued boldness, no matter what. They didn't care about being protected. They cared about the message. They cared about preaching boldly. And later we see that after the Sanhedrin uh, gets them again, they beat them, or they, uh, and they, they release them, and the apostles leave after being beat for the message now. Rather than just arrested, they're, they're beaten, and the scripture says, they rejoice that they were counted worthy of suffering dishonor for his name. Yea, I was beaten for Jesus. And they counted themselves worthy uh, for Jesus. But the trials were worth it, at least what's happened here, that he's arrested. And the scripture says 5,000 men, uh, the church grew to 5,000 men. That's not to mention women. Um, so a large, large group of people. And just the point is this, the message of the gospel took hold because of the willingness of Peter and John to stand up. That's why 5,000 are now in the church. Because Peter and John stood up. If they didn't stand up and speak the truth, maybe things went a little bit differently. The church would have grew slower, maybe. They took a great step of faith, trusting that the message they proclaimed was greater and more important than anything else. Do you believe that? Is the message of the gospel more important than anything else. More than anything else. Now, if those of you who are married, I mean, I would die for my wife, right? I would, I would give my life up for my wife like that. Do I have the same attitude for the gospel? Or am I like, oh, maybe a little protection? Maybe it would be helpful for us. See, what you value in life is what you will proclaim, right? And so if you value the gospel, you'll proclaim it. Um, in Christianity today, we have many things that have become more important than the gospel message. Lots of things. We have personalities. He's a good preacher, good teacher, whatever those things are. We, we exalt those people um, because of the gifts that maybe God has given them. And sometimes the preacher becomes more important than the message. And so in the past few years, we've had preachers who were orthodox preach great messages that we raise really high. What a great preacher. And some of them are have fallen into um, heresy. I'll just say it. They've fallen into heresy. But you go into a Christian bookstore, and their books are still there in the end cap. What have we done? The preacher, the teacher, is more important than the message. We have the trappings, buildings, and programs, much more important than the gospel. Um, how many little churches that have fallen apart around America that ha barely have any money and many great programs Faithful preachers of the gospel message. What's more important? We have those things. We have um, the oral law that we have added, like the Pharisees did, to Christianity. Right? We have things like uh, the things that Christians are supposed to do and things that Christians aren't supposed to do that aren't necessarily delineated clearly in the scripture. How you dress. Right? Some people are very concerned how you dress. If you don't dress that way, that's too provocative, that's this or that. We focus on that. Rather than the heart, what about, um, you know, it's who you hang with. Jesus was often maligned because of who he hung out with, right? Wrong people. Those are the wrong people. Hang out with the good Christians, as if there's any such thing. As, as, is anybody a good Christian? There's no, that's why we need Jesus. There's no good Christian, right? Jesus actually told us that. There, why are you calling me good? There's no one good but God, right? There's no good Christian. I understand what we're trying to say, if they're trying to follow Jesus and all that. But we exalt people like that and put them under pressure. What movies you see, right? What holidays Paul talked about, you choose to um, 
hold to. See, until we start live, until we start living like the message that we bear is the most important thing we have, the greatest blessing that has been given to us, until it becomes the reason that we get up in the morning, more so than anything else, we're never going to experience the power and the purpose God has given us. Because there will always be something that we think is greater. The message is the greatest thing. And this is why Peter and John and the other apostles had great impact. This is why the gospel spread in, in less than 100 years to the whole Roman Empire. Because the message was more important than anything else. More important than their families. Remember, Peter had a wife. Right? We don't hear about Peter's wife. It's not really part of the story. It's not relevant to what the gospel is trying to teach. But would you want to be Peter's wife? Right? What did she sacrifice? What did he sacrifice? Time with her. The gospel was more important even than his marriage, than his fishing job, than anything. The message was important. And he aligned his life to it, and he had purpose. I'm not saying those other things aren't important, but they're not as important as the main thing, the gospel. Why? Because the gospel comes from the Lord. And number three, there's no authority greater than God. There's no authority greater than God. Verse 5, the next day the rulers and the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power... Or what name did you do this? Did you heal the lame man? So at this point, now we have more people getting involved. Not just the, the priests are involved. Now we get the Sanhedrin involved. We get <coughs> rulers and, and, and elders and teachers of the law. So ruler is a general term. It's just a general term for leadership. In Acts 4.23, at least some of the rulers were identified as chief priests. So it's a general term that anybody that's in charge. So rulers could be Pharisees, Sadducees, priests, anybody that had... A place of authority. Uh, elders were leaders that were recognized among the people. They were um, leadership that could take different uh, forms. Uh, they were, in the Old Testament, a lot of times you would see that elders were laymen that oversaw general life and they would judge disputes among people. So if um, a, a, a church was having, a synagogue was having a fight over what color chairs to buy, they would go to the elder, the elder would kind of say, oh, okay, how are we going to work this out, right? A, a priest wouldn't do that, or a Sadducee or a Pharisee wouldn't do that. The elder would do that. Someone who was wise, wisdom. Elder doesn't mean old, though many times they were older, but it means someone who had uh, the wisdom of the Lord. So you had elders were there as well, probably secular people that wanted to kind of get involved. Then we have teachers of the law, which is another name for scribe. You see the word scribe in some translate. Scribes were teaching lawyers, right? So now we have the lawyers involved, right? Never a good sign, no offense, right? Never a good sign. Now the lawyers are involved, and, and teachers of the law could be from any Jewish sect. They were wise in the, the details of the law, and they, would, uh, they were lawyers because if you broke the law, you would go to trial, and they would prosecute you or defend you for the breaking of that law. So the scribes were those who kept records and were lawyers. So together with the priests and the elders and the scribes and, and the Sadducees and the Pharisees, all those together made up the... the uh, the Sanhedrin, 40 of them, made this ruling body called the Sanhedrin. And in Jerusalem, it was, it was the supreme court that presided over all religious matters that had to do with any Jew, whether they lived in Jerusalem, Judea, or beyond. The Sanhedrin was the, like the, the supreme court for these, these matters of, of religious law. And so we also have Annas and, Ca and Caiaphas. They were there. Remember, those were two of the Jewish leaders who were at the trials of Jesus. They were directly involved in the crucifixion of Jesus. We have others, um, John Alexander and others. We really don't know who they are. John might be, I believe, the uh, son of Caiaphas who became the next, or Aunt Annas, who became the next high priest. We're not really sure. But they were just part of the family. And so uh, this powerful Sanhedrin brings Peter and John before them, and they ask them basically one question. Where did you get the power? Whose authority do you have? Because it's not us. We didn't give you the authority. That's what they're thinking. They're thinking Jesus is dead, and we're the, we're the ultimate religious authority. Who gives you the power? Under what name, which is the same question, under what power do you do this miracle? And so Peter and John, notice they do not question the Sahedrin's authority. The question, they don't say, you have no authority over me. 
They recognize that the Sanhedrin does have authority. They will not obey any demand that contradicts what Jesus told them to do, but they accept that under Jewish under that Jewish law, that that leadership they had Jewish the Sanhedrin had um, judicial jurisdiction. Um, they are Jews, and they recognize that, and and they believe that Christianity, that wasn't called that then, was a fulfillment of Judaism, and so they were under the authority of the Sanhedrin, but that authority had limits. It wasn't greater than the limit that, that, that was given to them by God. The Sanhedrin should be under the authority of Jesus, not the other way around. So we can uh, obey any authority, and we should obey all authorities according to Romans 13, unless it, it uh, circumcedes the, the greatest authority, which is Jesus. And so the answer to the question we'll get to next week will shock the, the Sanhedrin because they think Jesus is dead, but he's not. Surprise! So there's a greater authority than the Sanhedrin. And we're going to stop at this. So here's the application. First one is simply this. Live with boldness. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're called to live with boldness. Boldness does not equal being annoying, by the way. There's a difference between being <laughs> bold and being annoying to someone, right? So let me just go through a few things if you want to live with boldness. The first one, you can't proclaim truth if you don't look for opportunities. Right? Peter and John are walking. They see an opportunity. A lame man. There's, again, there's many people that need to be healed. They see an opportunity where they can heal and preach the gospel. They were looking for the opportunity. That's why they went to the temple. And, that, and they had that as a pattern of their life. You're not going to proclaim the truth if you don't look for opportunity. If you just kind of go through life, just kind of exist day to day, doing the thing that every other human being does, and don't be pre proactive and looking for opportunities, guess what? You're not going to have any opportunities. You just won't have them. If I want to uh, preach to the Japanese people, right, then what do I got to do? I have to find some Japanese Go to Japan, go to find some Japanese people. I can't just go, gee, I wish I could preach to some Japanese people. Mimosa? I mean, what do we do? That's not what we're doing, right? If you want to preach to people who don't know Jesus, what are you going to do? <laughs> Go and make friends and love people who don't know Jesus. Right? You've got to look for an opportunity. You can't proclaim the truth if you don't know the truth. Second part, right? If, you don't know, if you're not reading the scriptures and studying the scriptures, you don't know, the, don't know what the Bible teaches, if you don't know what the gospel story is, if you don't even have a handle on the message that you were saved with, then the first step is to learn the truth. To learn what is true. Study the scriptures. Get in a Bible study. Come to church. Listen to stuff online from good teachers. Do, do whatever it takes to know the truth so you can proclaim the tr truth without wondering, gee, I, did I say the wrong thing? You can proclaim whatever you know, no matter how little, how big it is, how great it is, that at least you can proclaim the one thing. You will be my witnesses, Jesus said. So it doesn't matter if all you know is the name of Jesus and he saved me. That's the lame man, right? Uh, when Jesus healed a lame man, I don't know who he is, but all I know is he's healed me. I don't have a whole lot of information here, but what I have, I'm just going to tell you. You might not have a whole lot of information on what is true, what is not true. Fine. Two things. Proclaim what you know, look for opportunities, and learn more. And go from there. You can't, or you won't proclaim the truth if you don't believe God will use you. If you have a poor self-image or you think other people are much better Christians than you, and God can never use someone like you, number one, you're completely wrong. I mean, if you don't believe that and change your attitude, you're not going to take a chance. You're not going to have a risky faith to share your faith. You have to believe in you. See, God believes in you, right? That's why he chose you. That's why he called you. That's why he entrusted you with the message, because he believes in you. So believe in him as much as he believes in you, and you will be able to pr uh, proclaim the truth and God will use you no matter how uh, talented you might be or how untalented you might be in the area of life. And the final one is this. You can't proclaim the truth if you're unwilling to be hated and persecuted. Because you'll only go so far, and then the press will come on you. Go, hey, I don't want any conflict. I'm here. They didn't care about that. Right? They didn't look for conflict. They weren't annoying. Right? They didn't kick over tables and you know make a stink in places where they shouldn't make a stink. They didn't go into the temple proper and begin to proclaim. Right? They didn't, they didn't kind of make a, a scene. They were faithful with the message. And they weren't afraid of being 
hated, even by their own family. Remember, Jesus said, this is in Matthew 10, it's not in your outline, do not think I've, I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace. But what? A sword. Proclaiming truth will cause you to be hated. If you're unwilling to be hated and persecuted for the most important thing that we have, the message, you won't proclaim the truth. Uh, I don't know if you heard this past week in a man named Damon Atkins, who's a Christian, uh, is a Christian. He was arrested this past weekend in Reading, Pennsylvania at a Pride event. What did he do when it was so horrible? He began to read the Bible out loud. This is what he read from 1 Corinthians 14, 33. It's a verse, by the way, that is pretty, you know, it's not that harsh. It speaks of peace. For God is not a goth author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And at that point, he was arrested, cut off. Here's some other horrible things that he said as he was being arrested. I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just here to spread the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus saved me, and he can save everyone including you, pointing at the arresting officer. And he was arrested. You think it's not going to come? It's time to choose sides. There are two kingdoms clashing, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. It's time to make known what side you're on. You're going to have to choose. And this is where we, we practice our faith on a regular basis. The great book out there, if it's out of, out of, out of print or not, it's called a, a Long Obedience in the Same Direction. Right? Christianity isn't about a sprint. It's a long obedience. It's learning disobedience in the same direction. See, if, if you're not reading your script, the scriptures regularly, how do you expect to stand for Jesus when persecution comes? If you're not willing to lose your job because of Jesus, how, how are you going to think you're going to react when they come to your door? If you're not willing to share with your neighbor who knows you and loves you and cares for you the gospel, how are you going to stand when people who want to hurt you because of what you believe? You're not going to. It's short, in the short run. Do what is, be faithful now, and you'll be able to stand for the truth. And always remember that you are under authority. This is what it takes to not be annoying and be bold but not annoying. You are under authority. So a God expects you to obey and respect the authorities he has placed over you. Authorities of family, right? Uh, authorities of government, spiritual authorities, all those things. God has placed his authorities over us, and we're called to obey and respect them, um, even if we disagree with some of those things. For many of you who know me know this is really hard for me. I just don't like certain things a whole lot. I, just, I have a rebellious spirit. I always have. And I just want to, well, I don't like that. I'm not going to do that. But that's, that's sinful. That's sinful, because we're called to obey the authorities over us. But God clearly allows you to disobey those authorities only when they clearly, clearly, clearly command you to disobey that greater authority. Emphasis on the word clearly. Because sometimes we choose to obey the authorities because we just want to, and we, we evoke God into the situation. When it's not a clear, the government's not asking us, or the, my dad or my mom's not asking me to do anything that violates the law of God. I just, I'm rebellious. So the greater authority there in that scripture in Romans is not is God, not you. Right? So we, we only disobey the leaders over us who have a greater authority. And the greater authority is God, not me. Not how I think, or my worldview, or my ideology. So what that means is, that you and I have to watch our hearts very, very carefully. See, we're often willing to stand up for God when some authority seemingly, but not clearly, seemingly tells us to break God's commands when really that authority is simply making us feel uncomfortable. We just don't like the way things are going. We don't like the way the government's run. We don't like the way I, you know, my dad disciplines me. I don't like the way that church does things, whatever the authority is, right? And we, we rebel against it, not because it's against God's law, but because we're just uncomfortable. But we're not very quick to rebel against um, the authority when the authority is us. See what I'm saying? When we, um, 
we, we go through life and we, God says, don't break, don't pray for your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And we don't do that. And we go, I don't need to obey that. And we've broken the law. But we don't feel like we should rebel against that. But we want to rebel against the authority that are telling us to break the law. All the while we're breaking many laws in our lives. And so we have these two standards. The laws that I feel it's okay to break, to be disobedient to God. And we, we uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I lie a little bit. I have a problem with sin. And we justify ourselves. But the government says, don't do that. Oh, I can't have that. Right? And we rebel very harshly against that. Or we have kids, teenagers who rebel, right? Or people in church who, who gossip when it destroys the church uh, and the people and the, the leadership of the church. And so um, we, we overlook our minor disobediences like not reading the word or serving others or sharing our faith or attending worship or all those things God asks us to do because it's beneficial for us. And we, we're okay with those little minor disobediences. But when we feel uncomfortable, the first thing in our mind goes, oh, that's telling me that to disobey something in God's word, when really it doesn't. And it's just making us feel uncomfortable. I think the, the, the way it should work is simply this. Most of the time we feel we should rebel against the authorities over us. It's really not righteous anger or anything like that. It's simply sin. Simply sin. Obey the authorities. Peter and John did that, and God, even though they were arrested, God used that to glorify himself and preach the gospel. We are hypocrites when we point to the sin of another or our, some unjust authority while ignoring our own and not allowing God to transform our hearts in humility. Watch your heart and learn obedience to the one you and I call Lord. We call him Lord, right? Lord means you're obedient to him. If you're not obedient to his ways, if you don't want to walk like Jesus walked, then he's not your Lord. He might have saved you and you have your place in heaven, but you're not living like he's the authority in your life. See, as these apostles, Peter and John, as they walked with Jesus those three years, they began to learn obedience. Remember Peter when we first meet him in the Gospels? The guy is, is constantly wanting to break authority, right? He's challenging Jesus left and right, but all the while, he's learning obedience. We have a zealot who wanted to kill the Romans. We have a tax collector who wanted to be killed by the zealot. We have all these things going on, and they're learning obedience until we get to Pentecost, and the Spirit comes, and now we have Peter, who is the epitome of what it means to be obedient to God and man in a balanced way. They allowed Jesus to transform them so they could transform the world. And God wants to do the same with you and me. He wants to transform us. He wants us to learn obedience. Not because more obedience saves us. We're already saved. The blood of Christ is all grace. He wants us to learn obedience so we can be effective and be a great ambassador with this message. It's greater than anything you and I will ever have. That we can share that with people who are driving down a road, not seeing the sign, and the bridge is out. Are you willing to be hated? Are you willing to be persecuted for that message? Let's pray. Father, we, um, <clears throat> we stand before you, and, and in many ways, God, this, this message is really difficult, especially for me, God. It's really difficult when it comes to uh, obeying um, authority, especially governmental authorities, which I sometimes I see as so unjust and different, but yet it's really not a violation of your law in any way. And so, God, I, I struggle with that, and I know many other people struggle with similar things like that. But, but above all else, God, this message really was um, a call to our hearts to assess where we really are. Do we really believe the gospel message is what you proclaim it to be, Lord? That it is the salvation for everyone who believes. It has power, and it is the greatest possession that we have as your followers. And we must be willing to give up everything to follow you. No one, you said, Jesus, uh, can, can follow me if they, they put their hand to the, to the plow and then keep looking behind. We have to be all in or not in at all. You, you spew lukewarm from your mouth and you want hot or cold. There is no middle ground. There is one way and you call us to follow it and be willing to give up everything for it. I pray, God, that for myself and for everyone here, that whatever that next step might be and I commit it to you, 
that we be willing to take that message seriously, that we, we drop our, our lawn chairs and our spiritual mimosas and we would be serious about the message and proclaim it with boldness no matter what it costs us because you have called us to. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.